So you, your excellencies, the distinguished professors, and the distinguished staff, members of this uh, the distinguished great university. I'm pleased to thank the organizers of this event, especially Mr. Eruki Tomioya, chairman of the board, Historians Without Borders, and to thank you, Your Excellency uh, Bishop of uh, Helsinki, and all of you, my brothers and sisters, for this occasion to be here in your midst and to want to share a few thoughts with you on uh, the role and the character of history, especially in the context of peace building and the context of reconciliating people. I thank you, Mr. Eki, for your warm words of introduction and everything that is brought us here. If you were wondering which airlines brought us so punctually on time, it was the German. <laughs> This was Lufthansa, so, so, so uh, you may send them the medal. <laughs> I have the opportunity then to share with you this afternoon these other few uh, reflections on a subject matter that you've been dealing with already since yesterday. Not having been part of the opening discussions and the speeches, I recognize that I may be treading on some already trodden parts and dealing with issues that probably have come up already and have been dealt with. If that happens, I just ask to be uh, forgiven. It's probably been said already here, since this program has began, that a very common statement, at least in our part of the world, is that it's only winners who write history. Losers hardly write histories, and history is uh, to a large extent written by winners. That being the case, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you about the role of history in this regard, especially in the, in the setting of peace building and reconciliation and address this essentially for who I am. So I'm a Catholic by faith. I work for the Vatican or the Holy See, but I am from Ghana, West Africa. And so I come before you this afternoon with all of these identities. And it is from these same perspectives that I wish to share the few thoughts that I'm about to share with you. So what can be the contribution then that I can make, bring to this? Certainly I can share the experience of the use of history in religious literatures, especially in scripture, which is the source and the basis of our belief system. The type of historiography which is found very much in the Old Testament and which finds its fulfillment in the New Testament later. I can also share with you the experience from our part of the continent about certain crucial historical experiences like the slave trade and even like the meeting in Berlin which divided the African continent into the different states that we do have now the impact of that on the different states and the peoples on that continent, recognizing how that division split tribes and assigned tribes to different countries which become sovereign states, and then probably struggle to develop relationship among themselves. We can look at that, but again, we can also look at being here as a cardinal of the Catholic Church to see about how all of this is also true, also in the Catholic Church. It's on statements in the past, it's documents which have contributed to certain historical developments, and how the popes have uh, later on tried to reevaluate some of these documents in the light of several world historical events and conditions. There are very many of you who are very familiar with 
the origins of you know, biblical Christian faith, recognize how much history is part of the development and the formulation of our faith. History becomes a context for the development of biblical faith. History is a context for the development of everything that we know about the God of the Old Testament, who then finds fulfillment in the New Testament writings. And so in the Old Testament, an event like the Exodus becomes a very crucial event that encapsulates, as it were, the memory of the people of God in the Old Testament, and which becomes a crucial point of reference subsequently in the history of God's people in the Old Testament. It becomes a point of reference for the people's own relationship with God. God reminded them all the time never not to forget what he did for them, the mighty works that, brought, that he displayed on their behalf and that brought them out of Egypt to their own land of promise. This is of a, taken only by another subsequent liberation event, which is the ending of the captivity of Babylon which would again become another motif in the Old Testament with God's people presenting their own relationship with God and with one another. So this is historical experience and part of the experience in which history, in the form of a memory, has shaped the lives of these people. So history, in the, term, in the sense of the events, which constitutes make such experiences, then build a memory. A memory which becomes a source in the, in the, in the, in the sense of the Old Testament of legislations, which become the source of ethics or morality, and which becomes a source of point of reference even for relationship with other tribes and other people around them. Memory then becomes very crucial in this. And the formation of memories through historical events, is stuff that we can look at and spend a lot of time discussing and considering. For the same reason, we can also look at uh, uh, similar events. This time, uh, stepping out of the Old Testament, as I briefly mentioned, we can look at events in the context of the continent of Africa, the famous slave trade, and the castles which are left behind, so that we still have memory of that. We do have memories of the slave trade, not only when we visit the United States and see the Afro-Americans over there. We have memories of the slave trade when we visit the West African sea coast and see the castles which dot the sea coast and the reminders that they provide about what went on in those castles. There is also a thing about colonization that we can also think about as a crucial historical experience, which is also formed, formed, formed a memory for the people in the area. These then can also become uh, memories of the evaluation of which can become a subject matter of our discussion. To what extent all of this promote peace building and to what extent all of this promote reconciliation and making people live together in harmony. I will try briefly to go through all of this, but most importantly to see how, as a church, we make use of, so we make use of some of these uh, epochal events which have built big memories for people, how they are re-evaluated, but also how they are corrected, and how they are reintegrated in the new sense and new identity of, of the church itself. And so, for example, my dear friends, the church has always experienced a rereading of history in order to understand and to redirect her actions as she journeys on in the world. The famous ecumenical council, for example, the last one being the Second Vatican Council, became a moment for the church to reread its past history in the light of which he decided to set new trajectories along which to travel. One crucial document which captures the new trajectory that the church set for itself at the Second Vatican Council 
was a document called The Church in the Modern World, Gaudium et Spes, within which the church decided then to establish a new relationship with humanity. In fact, at the beginning of this council, what Pope John XXIII had said was, he wanted the windows of the church to be thrown open so that the world outside can see into the church and so that the church can see the world outside. With this, the Pope called for a new relationship between church and the world or church and society. No more the turn of a church as it were, considering itself as a disparate society and a group within in the human family. So this signaled a new form of relationship in the light of which the past history of the church in several situations and occasions were reread. I just point out, uh, draw attention, or you know, uh, point to just a few of these. The, to, to begin with, the Second Vatican, the Second Vatican Council, having begun 1963 to 65, was a council whose beginning coincided by design, by divine providence, with the independence movement in Africa. Several African countries got independent in the same period, in the 60s, just when the church was, had gathered in the Second Vatican Council to find out a new way of establishing relations with the church, with the, with, with the world. And so right after, the, after this conference, Pope John XXIII made it a big concern to devote, to pick up and to develop the issue of development. Development as the new and the latest challenge to human existence. What is to happen to these new countries which are now emerging as new nation states? Decolonization had meant the development of new nation states and how these were to be evaluated and considered became a subject matter of the Second Vatican Council on the, the issue of development. Accordingly, when Pope Paul VI succeeded Pope John Paul John XXIII in his first big encyclical called the Development of People, Popularum Progressio. He redefined peace in terms of development. And he said that the new name of peace was development. But immediately then added that development, however, is not possible without peace or peaceful environment. So the development of the new nation states became a big concern of the church. This is very significant, I mean, by, by, by hindsight, looking at a whole lot of church documents, part of which now is a big issue, for example, in a place like Canada. Some of the church documents had been sometimes been taken as, you know, documents like Terra Nullius, No Man's Land which accompanied the settlement of European states in places like North Canada, Australia, and several other places. A document that kind of gave the impression that these lands were not, didn't have any inhabitants or people, and that people were free to you know, amass and take in possession of any land that they wanted. This is lately been now being considered. The new Attorney General of Australia last year uh, over, 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 over wrote this and this dismissed the terra nullius type of doctrine, recognizing the aborigines and their right to, uh, to live on the land. So again, some such backdrop, it becomes so, so, so meaningful why the church now should be interested in development of nations and development of people and uh, help advance their cause. The second thing that comes up, again, from the point of view of the church, uh, in terms of memory building and how uh, events in the past are used to, to, to promote human development, peace, and reconciliation, is the fact that this same Second Vatican Council, which called for a new relationship between uh, the church and the world outside, signaled a new way of looking and integrating the role of science in society and even in the life of the church. And so right after the Second Vatican Council, it was, it was, uh, it took uh, Pope John Paul II to set up a commission to reevaluate the role of Galileo in church history 
and in church thinking. The commission that evaluated that came out with a result which finally led again to the reformulation or reintegration of Galileo and his teaching within the, within, within the church. The church recognizing, if you want, that he made a mistake with that redefinition and so reintegrated you know, Galileo within you know, in the history of the church. And so with that, Pope John Paul II, uh, Pope John Paul II again, signaling a new type of relationship, a new revisiting of, revisiting of, uh, of memory and tradition, which led to a sense of reconciliation with the world of science and the, and the, and the new uh, society in which the church uh, found itself. And so in the case of uh, the relationship with Galileo, Pope John Paul II talked about purifying memory. So historical events do not only build up memory, heritages as uh, was, were used in the, in the earlier discussion, but it comes to a point that also this memory needs to be revisited and sometimes even purified. And with the reintegration of Galileo within the church and the condemnation of a tent, it was a case of revisiting memory and purifying it, correcting where this, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know it, it, it went wrong. At the same time, the same Pope will signal as another, another revisiting of memory in the light and in view of reconciliation and new peace building. And it will be revisiting the period in the past of the Inquisition. This revisit of this period also led to the Pope asking for pardon, asking for pardon from the very many who suffer from this uh, you know, period in the past of the church's history Again, with view to again fashion some reconciliations and some bond. So history in the form of memory is not cast in as it were a concrete block of stone. It's something that can be revisited, reinterpreted, and sometimes even corrected in the light of what human life and human development needs to be. So Pope, uh, after the Second Vatican Council, then Pope John Paul II signaled these two movements for us. Speaking of painful history and the purification of memory, how could we then forget? You know, this uh, uh, another uh, move that Pope John Paul II made when he visited Senegal. Standing on the coast of Senegal on an island called Gore, and looking out across the Atlantic Ocean, Pope John Paul II again thought about the slave trade. And thinking about the slave trade again, he begged for forgiveness from above for the awful error of those who enslaved brothers and sisters who were destined to be recipients of the gospel. So these experiences are known within the church Revisiting memory to purify them, however bitter and unpleasant they may be, always with view to reintegrating the church far better in a better way within society. So the first was the symposium done on the Pontifical Council of Latin America, again in 1992, where Pope John Paul II again brought up the issue of history of evangelization in the Americas itinerary, identity, and the hope of a continent. Receiving the participants of this symposium, the Pope said to them, therefore we do not celebrate controversial historical events. We are aware of the fact that his historical events and their interpretation are a complex reality which has to be studied carefully and patiently. From this is expected a valuable, serious, impartial input and a peaceful judgment on the facts. Actually then, the historian has this task not to be influenced by any partisan interest or later ideological thinking, which is the occasion for historical analogy applying current values to uh, events that did take place in the past, 
but dispassionately looking at the views with view to discovering the truth of events that happen and integrating them into human life and society. So this second symposium then is, uh, is, is one which an office within the Vatican, the Historical and Theological Commission of the Central Committee of the Great Jubilee of Inquisition then took up. And with that again, the Pope says, speaking, I ask for forgiveness and it is necessary to have exact knowledge of the facts and to put shortcomings with regard to what the gospel requires in the context where they are effectively found. And so the common, the commission presented to the Pope Sil John Paul II, a dossier of 800 pages with clear content on the sinful nature of some of what happened in those days. This promoted, this prompted the Pope to apologize again in the church's name on the 12th of March in the year 2000 during a mass a celebration celebrating a day of atonement. So the smallest, the, the, the basic of, uh, uh, a fact that I'm making is that events in the past do constitute memories with which we live. And living with this memory, every now and then new changes and new moments and situations in life invite us to revisit the memories and then to reevaluate them. Reevaluating the memory is always a tricky business because the temptation is there to apply current structures and values to things in the past. But the desire is always to find the truth about what happened and then to see how this can be well integrated in the present ongoing life of a community, of society, or even the world, so that reconciled, rendered harmonious again, it can realize the best of its own life. And so, my dear friends, the topic that you have dwelt on, as you can easily see, calls for careful discernment and considerable knowledge of history. The indispensable contribution of historians will certainly be a help to theologians and to people of faith in understanding their religion and understanding the basis even of their faith. But this also calls for due discernment and circumspection in evaluating events of the past with view to finding the truth so that the truth can be applied and truth can maintain and keep the society going. And so on the threshold then of the third millennium, Pope John Paul says to us again, standing on this threshold, we may rightly hope that political leaders and people, especially those involved in tragic conflicts, fueled by hatred and the memory of often, often ancient wounds, will be guided by the spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation, exemplified by the church's own initiative in asking for pardon and reconciliation for events of the past. Subsequently then, we had other posts follow this instance, and the big relic of St. Andrew, which was kept by the Latin church, it's been restituted, given back to the Orthodox Church as a gesture again of healing of memory and promoting uh, reconciliation. In the same way, last uh, June, Pope Francis visits Bolivia, and in Bolivia, thinking about how the native population of, uh, of Latin America suffered from early European arrivals and Christian uh, work. Again, ask for pardon for everything, every abusive treatment that was meted out to this indigenous population on the arrival of Europeans on that continent. So all of these revisions of history then become very crucial in terms of making history play very significant and important roles in the ongoing life of humanity and history. We need to revisit our memory, heal them where they need to healing, 
correct them where they need to be corrected, but make them positively then drive us on in our growth and our development. The conditions for interpreting this can indeed be risky, as I've tried to say, and there is the invitation to watch out sometime for some traps. Uh, uh, reconciliation as a part to peace can sometimes be accompanied by some pitfalls, if not even holes. So let me now share with you some criteria borrowed again from same church documents about how some of these principles, principles of revisiting memory with view to re, uh, fashion reconciliation among groups and people can be done or are sometimes done. So we've mentioned John Pope John Paul the second and what he did in the year 2000. These criteria are influenced by the Christian faith, but in many ways they can contribute to a clear part in the outdoors way to reconciliation and peace between people. I wish to recall here that the document with which the Pope celebrated reconciliation bears the title Memory and Reconciliation, the Church and the Faults of the Past. Memory and Reconciliation, the Church and the Faults or Mistakes, if you want, of the Past. Obviously, it is not enough to scientifically study the subject of past mistakes with a highly competent commission. This does not solve the problem in itself. There is the need to recognize the established misconduct, the, prom the promise not to repeat them, and to repair the damage that arises from them and to provide, to promote, if you want, a culture that repels the germs that produce the same evils in the past and recognize clearly the movement ahead. The task of responsibility in this is a, is a crucial thing to look at. When we talk about visiting the memory with view to healing and making it you know, serve the purpose of reconciliation, a big subject matter that comes up is responsibility. Responsibility in this sense then need to be understood either objectively or subjectively. Objective responsibility refers to the moral value of the act in itself, insofar as it is good or evil, and thus refers to the imputability of the action. Subjective responsibility concerns the effective perception by individual conscience of the goodness or the evil of the act performed. And so, subjective responsibility ceases and dies with the disappearance of the subject who performed the act. It is not transmitted through generation and the descendants do not inherit subjective responsibility for the acts of their ancestors, if you want. And so in this case, asking for forgiveness presupposes a contemporaneity between those who are hurt by an action and those who committed it. The only responsibility then that is capable of continue, continuing in history can be the objective kind, the objective responsibility to which one may freely adhere subjectively or not. And therefore, the evil done often outlives the one who did it. And through the consequences, the consequences of behavior, that can become a heavy burden on the consciences and memories of the descendants. In this sense, we know about how the state of Germany accepted to make amendment and repair for the Holocaust. We've heard, you know, we know about how the city of Liverpool in London also tried to make an amendment for its role and part in the slave trade. And some such events do, do exist. They all represent cases of recognizing objective, taking objective responsibility for an event of the past and undertaking a gesture 
or an action to help heal them, always with view to helping to reintegrate an event of the past into the positive conduct of society in the present. And so it is necessary above all to take into account the different processes of reception of acts. It is the place of the communication around the event that we have to work on, making sure that the message reaches all the protagonists by creating communication relays and multipliers and avoiding misappropriation of the original meaning and the object, uh, original meaning and objective sense of the event. In the next step, it is also necessary to specify the appropriate subject called to speak about the faults of the past or the mistakes. Discernment in this case is of great necessity. It is necessary to check whether the group or the individual that asks for forgiveness in any event, depending on the level of the offense, actually is the one to do so. However, one should not forget that reciprocity at times impossible because of religious conviction of, uh, of others in society and of dialogue partners cannot be considered an indispensable condition and that the gratuity of love, at least for the Christian church, often expresses itself in unilateral initiatives and forgiveness. This said, I just briefly now want to draw attention to one or two dangers to be avoided as we try to revisit the memory, try to heal them, and try to positively integrate them in the ongoing life of any society. The first danger to try to avoid is the trap of standing before those who begin, who begin a reconciliation process by judging, thinking that they are better. We must avoid arrogance that leads us to think that man of the, the people of the past or those accused of, the, uh, accused of an evil or an deed in the past are the worst in human history. The evil hounds the man of all times, and all generations are called to make an examination of conscience for not walking the same path that led to the evil situations of the past. We can see how in many countries, some judges have stood up, alleging to act for the salvation of the people, and they in turn, uh, they in turn became tormentors of the people by a suffering uh, that has just, uh, by rubbing in the pain of those whom they seek to, uh, whose suffering they seek to alleviate. So revisiting the past, especially when one is on the offended side, may not be accompanied or may not be done with a sense of self-righteousness, condemning those who perpetrated the crime as the worst in history, but with a certain amount of openness that makes and allows for reconciliation. Second thing would be, it is wise to avoid asking the impossible reparation that would create even revolts and other damages. And so firstly, the objectivity of reparation allows victims or their descendants not to stay in the wounds because the reparation has not arrived. On the other hand, the purpose for which the reparation is done, which is reintegration, repair, and the ongoing life of society must affect the demands for repair that are made, putting reparation, reconciliation above the required demands for damages and repairs. Then we also need to recognize that the story of an individual is never the absolute. One's individual story needs to recognize that it fits into the story of humanity and that the story of humanity is bigger than the story of an individual. It is almost like what Pope Francis has said lately that the whole is bigger than a part. 
And in the light of this, seek revisiting the memory or an event of the past with view to healing it so that it can fit and promote the well-being of society, needs to invite and to recommend to those who are seeking such repair, recognition for the greater good of society, rather than insisting on small individual reigns, which can then rupture and even sometimes you know, disrupt the reparation or reconciliation that is needed. This happens every day. Just last December, in Paris, negotiating for the, you know, uh, at the climate change for 1.5 or less than two degrees increase, we had nations who were insistent on the fact that coming from poorer nations, what they've been invited to make atonement for was basically caused by the rich Western nations. And so they are the ones to assume the brunt of all of this and assume the charge, the, 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 the demands of everything that the climate change you know, repair called for. And it called for a certain amount of reasoning to convince and to show that this is the time for repair and not the time to apportion or to assign blames so that we can all move on. So the whole sometimes is the whole is always bigger than the part, and sometimes the vision of that helps in the process of reconciliation and the process of bringing people together. So, by way of concluding this uh, small thought shared about how the revisiting of memory created by history need always to be done with view to promoting the ongoing life of a community in the here and now and they need to avoid certain traps or certain uh, gestures which stall or which even prevent such a reconciliation process. I come now to conclude by you know, simply drawing attention to uh, 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 these uh, this, this few, a few points in history and to simply observe that when in 2014 Pope Francis went to speak to the Council of Europe, he insisted specifically on the fact that we need memory, we need courage, and we need a sound and a humane utopian vision that can direct our revisit or revisiting of our memory and the courage to make it propel us into the future. Creativity then continues to meet the challenge of multiple polarity, and transversality. And so for Pope Francis then, the prestigious, uh, when he was given the prestigious award of, uh, for Europe, the Charlemagne Prize, for his significant contribution to the consolidation of uh, uh, consolidation and building of Europe, uh, of European peace and solidarity, in receiving that award, the Pope again appealed to the culture of dialogue and the social economy by stating that this culture of dialogue invites us, both the victims and the victors, to come together to accept to talk about our wounds and our pains so that we can find new ways of reconciled existence and proceeding with our lives for the future. For this then, the Pope recommends an education and dialogue for all to be begun and undertaken in schools, in centers of living, including even families, so that open to receiving and listening to one another, we succeed in fashion reconciliation, building bridges, and fashioning a future that help promote the well-being of the human family. And I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, and uh, it was great to hear, Your Excellency, your, your thoughts and, and, and views, also the role of the Catholic Church in some of, some of this mediation and reconciliation, and I was particularly impressed by the, your, your message about the indigenous people's rights, slave trade, and, and uh, Galileo, Galilei's 
uh, science and, and, and this reconciliation actually uh, with the past. But now uh, let me introduce the, the other panelist here, uh, Mr. Eamon Gilmore, the former uh, uh, Foreign Minister of Ireland, uh, former uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Ireland and currently the European Union's uh, Special Envoy for the Colombian uh, peace process. And let us start with the commentary from Mr. Emon, please. Thank you very much indeed. And um, it's uh, a great privilege to be taking part in this um, excellent event. And I'd like to thank uh, Erki in particular for organizing it. Uh, as I listened uh, to you, your, your eminence, your a very comprehensive uh, presentation to us this evening, um, I was reminded of a comment which was made by one of the earlier contribution, contributors to this event who said that history is written as national narratives. Um, and it occurred to me, of course, that um, the Catholic Church has a far longer uh, collective memory uh, than any uh, nation state. And I think you demonstrated that uh, to us uh, this, this afternoon as you uh, traced history uh, as scripture, um, the history of the church itself, some of the history of Africa, including the, uh, the slave trade, um, the uh, revisiting of history uh, by, the, um, uh, by the church, uh, the distinctions between uh, subjective and objective uh, responsibility and uh, the whole issue of uh, reparation uh, and restoration and in the process of reconciliation. Um, our topic this afternoon is about the role of history in reconciliation and in peace mediation. And I want to, I'm, I'm not a historian myself, I'm one of these people that Margaret Macmillan described, a policy maker uh, who reads history books in airport lounges and on long flights. Uh, so I'm not a historian. Um, but um, I, I want to draw on, in respect of reconciliation and peace mediation, on two elements of my own experience. Uh, in relation to reconciliation, uh, my experience of the Northern Ireland peace process, uh, for which I had responsibility as foreign minister uh, for its management uh, during the time that I was in government, uh, and in respect of peace mediation, my current work uh, on the peace process uh, in Colombia. Uh, on reconciliation, um, Northern Ireland, um, it's 18 years ago now since the Good Friday Agreement, uh, which uh, gave us the peace agreement, which ended violence. Um, it's been largely successful. Northern Ireland is at peace. Uh, the political institutions are established. We recently had elections again for them. And relations between Britain and Ireland have never been better. But there are still issues. In many ways, it's still a work in progress. Uh, Northern Ireland is still a divided society. We talk about borders at this conference as borders uh, between countries. In the city of Belfast, 18 years after the peace agreement, there are 50 peace walls. These are physical barriers uh, separating people of the Catholic and Protestant uh, faiths and their, uh, and their traditions. It's not because there are sectarian attacks at the moment. There haven't been for a very long time, uh, uh, very fortunately. But there's a memory of it. And there's a fear that it could happen again. And it will take time for those barriers uh, to break down. And I mention that because, in a way, history has revisited uh, the Northern Ireland environment. Uh, Five or six years ago, the British and Irish government, uh, when we talked with each other, uh, we, we anticipated that we were facing into what we called a decade of commemorations. The period from 1912, when the British agreed to give home rule to Ireland, and Ulster Unionists mobilised uh, in arms to resist it, uh, right through from the 1916 rising the Declaration of Independence in, in 1919, right through to our civil war uh, after the, the treaty uh, in uh, 1922. And we recognized that revisiting uh, that uh, period of history and remembering it 
Uh, could, as happened uh, 50 years ago when we commemorated the 50th anniversary of these events, that it could contribute to conflict and to tension rather than to uh, eliminate it. And therefore, we talked with each other, this is the Irish and the British governments, about how we could approach this decade of commemorations in a way that would contribute to reconciliation and to bringing communities together and to making a better uh, future for everybody. And inevitably, in these discussions, there is always the temptation uh, to say, well, let's, let's forget about the past. Let's move on. Let's not dwell on the past. A, an attitude that says, let's not mention the war. Uh, and we felt that if we did that, we would leave the historical narrative and the uh, commemoration of history to those who would seek to exploit it and to use it uh, to create division. And therefore, we came to the conclusion that what we needed was not less history, but more history. And we sent for the historians. And we said, we want to know more about this period of time so that we can better understand it. We want to understand it not in terms of heroes and villains, but in terms of the people, the context in which they live, the lives in which they live, what life was like uh, at that period uh, of, uh, of time. And we designed a thinking around this decade of commemoration, which was designed to promote and to contribute to reconciliation. And the tone for that, I think, was set when Queen Elizabeth visited Ireland in 2011, first time ever uh, that uh, the head of state of our neighbouring country uh, visited, uh, came on a state visit uh, to, uh, to, to Ireland. Very historic moment. And in the course of that visit, she confronted directly the complex history between our islands. And she reflected that, uh, and I'm quoting uh, broadly from her, when she said uh, that with the benefit of hindsight, there are things we would wish to have done differently or not at all. And I was with her when she visited uh, the Garden of Remembrance. This is a place in Dublin uh, which was established to commemorate the sacrifice of the people who fought in 1916 uh, to win Irish freedom. Very, very special place uh, in our history. Very, very solemn place. And she came and she visited there and she laid a wreath. And she bowed in the memory of the people who had fought for Irish uh, freedom. And it was a, a remarkable moment and, in a way, a turning point uh, in the relations uh, between the islands. And since then, we have had many events uh, commemorating that period of time, uh, which is about sharing our history. We developed this concept of, of history as something that we share uh, on, our, on, uh, on our two uh, uh, islands. Uh, I recall, for example, being present at the headquarters of Google uh, when they digitized the war records of the entire island. And I was there with the First Minister of Northern Ireland, with the second uh, Deputy First Minister who comes from the other uh, tradition, with the British Ambassador. But most remarkably, there were people from all over the island, families who came with their memorabilia. And the significance of this is that in the south of Ireland, there was a kind of a shame for a long time in our, in our um, history, a shame uh, if family members, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of Irish people fought in the British Army, with the British Army in the 1914-18 to 18 war. But after independence, there was a kind of a, an airbrushing of this from our history. And even within families, almost uh, a certain reluctance to acknowledge that a member of the family had fought uh, in the British uniform. All of that has changed. People are now talking about it and, and sharing it. And the reason that I tell that story is that because I think that uh, the, the approach that we took was, was not one to kind of move away from history, but to, uh, to have more of it, to understand it better, and to approach it in a way that is people-centered and that is about sharing uh, our, uh, our experience. Because of my experience of the Northern Ireland peace process, the, high rep the EU High Representative Federica Mogherini uh, asked me to take on the role as um, Special Envoy for the European Union for the peace process in Colombia. The circumstances are very different. Uh, scale for a start, uh, the Colombian FARC uh, insurgency, which has gone on now for over 50 years, uh, has claimed the lives of 220,000 people in that period of time. Six million people have been displaced. It's on an enormous uh, scale, one of the bloodiest conflicts uh, that, we have, uh, that we have seen. 
But it's not about borders and it's not about national identity. It's, it's an internal, uh, it's an internal uh, conflict. And therefore, the way in which history impacts on it is, is somewhat different. Uh, it is the history in Colombia of generation after generation almost, uh, phases of internal conflict and civil war and, uh, and violence. And I suppose probably the biggest impact is its recent history. The memory that uh, people who live today uh, have of the um, conflict, the impact on them, the fact that they are victims from it, and the fact that they still see around them those, the perpetrators, uh, the subjective responsibility, as you uh, refer to uh, your, your eminence. Um, and I think one of the, the very good things that is happening in the peace negotiations at present between the government of Colombia and FARC is the involvement of victims. They've brought the victims to Havana where the talks are taking place, representatives of victims. Victims have been made very much part of the, uh, of, of the process. Uh, the talks are not yet concluded. I hope that they will be soon and I'm optimistic that they will be uh, successful. But I believe that the involvement of victims and the facing up to recent, uh, the recent history, which uh, if uh, it is not addressed, uh, could contaminate and spoil the process as we move forward, I think will be a strength of, of, that, um, of that peace process. So in conclusion, I think um, I would say that in terms of making a contribution to um, uh, reconciliation and to peace mediation, uh, that what we need is more history, better history, uh, a shared history, and I think also a recognition uh, that, that, that the development of that kind of history and historical narrative and historical analysis is only possible when there is peace. Uh, periods of conflict, uh, people do retreat uh, into that uh, uh, type of uh, fantasy of history that, uh, that you referred to uh, earlier. Um, and of course, by, by developing that kind of historical narrative, I think we contribute to um, the making of peace and to reconciliation between people. Thank you. Thank you, Eamon. And, and um, I have a question to both of you. And it's about, uh, since we are in a hall of historians here today, can there be too much history? Sometimes. I'm, I'm uh, referring to two cases when he worked on the independence of Kosovo and, and, and the conflict between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, very many people started to remember kosovo polia fight, 1389. And a part of the identity was what happened in Kosovo Polya quite many centuries ago. Or, uh, actually, you, Your Excellency, mentioned uh, the issue of the African borders. Very often, actually, we come, when we deal with the African conflicts, we come to the issue of the borders. And sometimes, actually, it's, uh, it's almost like an excuse. We cannot do anything because in Berlin, so many uh, years ago, something was decided and that mixed our uh, African borders or African identity are actually, is history sometimes used as an excuse of, of doing nothing? <laughs> no, I don't think it's an excuse. Referring to something that has happened can never be an excuse because it did happen. It's a reality of our past. And so, uh, it's like you know, Minister has just said, it's an invitation for us to recognize something that has happened. And probably what, what happens in this case is uh, it's as an occasion for us to look at the flaws, to look at the mistakes that were made in those decisions, and to probably then learn from them and not want to you know, uh, repeat them later in any other situation. But it's not an excuse that the event in Berlin took place. It's not an excuse that borders were drawn. What, uh, what, what there is is to learn, from them, uh, to learn from them in those days. They're thinking that you know, a couple of European nations could sit around the table and feel that they have a right to divide and share a country. That's something that, you know, that, that we need to think about. Okay, uh, but that did happen and that is taking place. And what we, the challenge that is, uh, we, we face it now is to reintegrate this experience. I mean, the, the mistake would be to sit back and to, like a wounded dog, lick our wounds huh, forever. 
we cannot lick our wounds over that, you know, that it, it's, it's taking place. So the thing is to see how we reintegrate this event of the past into our history now to enable us to go on. You know, because uh, that's what it is. I mean, life for the continent did not stop with that event, and it's still ongoing. So that we need to deal with this challenge that is taking place, which is part of African history, and see how we can make this challenge advance our own growth and development. May I actually continue uh, with sure. you, uh, still with another question and about the African peace processes, because we have a very successful story of the South Africa and of the peace and reconciliation, where actually the truth was told by everyone and recorded, but nobody, so to say, is sitting, sitting in jail after that or in, in, in prison after that process. Now when we are dealing with the Darfur or, or Sudan or Somalia and, and, and so on, we are actually in a very formal justice processes, where those guilty ones uh, in the end are in, in, in national justice bodies or even in the ICC in the, in the Hague. And these are very different processes. Um, do you, can you see some, say something about, based on your experience, on, on, on mm -hmm. the good experience from South Africa compared with actually some of those conflicts that are now ongoing? Should we learn something from the South Africa process or should we go more on the formal justice side? Mm. I, th I think the magic of the South African process is like, you know, what uh, uh, His Excellency, you know, just referred to, the role of the victims in the process. And the victims coming in not to accuse or not to de demand, you know, the pound of flesh or the head of, of the perpetrators of this. It is to come in and to have the people, uh, get the people to recognize their wrongdoing. And having recognized their wrongdoing, their own ability to forgive them. And this brings us to, you know, sitting here as a, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a churchman, I cannot help but, you know, uh, go on from one step to see, you know, uh, when actually, you know, from, from, so from a Christian religious you know, point of view, we talk about reconciliation. We uh, making use of an expression which is very normally used, popularly used. You know, anything happens and people say we want justice. Okay, for us, we want justice means that we want a return to the state of uh, harmonious, you know, uh, you know, uh, living that did exist, did, uh, exist before the era, before whatever evil or whatever sin was committed was committed. So reconciliation, at least in biblical religion, is, is a justification. It's any act that one undertakes to justify another. And this process of justification is to restore us in, into relationship again. And part of it, or the big way that this is done, is through forgiveness. You know, sometimes when somebody does wrong, you make his wrong known to him, and he can ask for pardon, or he can challenge it. When he challenges, then, you know, a situation of going to, you know, going to a tribunal or whatever comes up. But the idea at the end of the day is to have somebody see what they did wrong, and one can then ask for atonement, or one can simply forgive. And the one thing that I suppose happened in the South African thing was not to ask for atonement, but simply to be able to forgive. And the act of forgiveness is what helped the perpetrators themselves grow out of, if you want, the criminality you know, uh, that they meted out to, uh, to the other people. And this, I think, is the thing that presently, as I say, I'm looking at another situation like that in South Sudan, where we also get in, you know, involved in some of the things. And this is going to be the thing. I mean, uh, Pope Francis told us one war leads to another war. So we're not looking to, you know, pay a violent situation with another instance of violence. So the thing then that we, uh, you know, going after or helping to push on is just this great power of forgiveness. It may be tough, but that is probably the one thing that doesn't leave any trail of vengeance or any trail of anger or bitterness. And that is the one thing that I think we push in all of this situation of reconciliation. And that's what the South African Institute teaches us. Thank you, Excellency. Same questions, actually, to Iman. I think the problem is not history. Um, we cannot change the past. Uh, we can try to be better informed about it, uh, to uh, understand it better. Uh, I think the problem uh, is 
how we use the past in the present uh, and how we use history uh, as part of the current political uh, debate or uh, discussion uh, narrative uh, that takes place. Um, and the past will always be relied on. Uh, uh, policy makers in the present, politicians in the present, uh, people who are trying to shape the future, whatever type of future it is that they're trying to shape, will lean back to the past uh, to uh, draw lessons, uh, to uh, draw analogies, uh, and to root uh, policy making and to root uh, the, 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 their current views in, in, in their view of the past or their interpretation of the past. And that's the problem, because very often the past is misused. Um, and the problem isn't the past itself, it's not the history, it's not the learning of the past, it's the misuse of it, it's the abuse of, of, the, of the past. Somebody made reference uh, here, I think, uh, yesterday morning in opening the conference about, for example, in the current debate uh, in Britain on exit from the European Union. Uh, the analogy that is being drawn with uh, Hitler and the Nazis and comparing this with, uh, you know, the perceived uh, injustices of the uh, uh, European institutions and how they impact on uh, British policy making and so on. I mean, it's a fantastic, uh, you know, fantastically uh, daft in one way, uh, but dangerous uh, analogy to make. And there are many other examples in, in, uh, in, in uh, recent times of that type of thing being, being done, of history being abused. Thank you, and I, I, I think our uh, clock is ticking also for this panel, and, and people are, are looking for their coffee break and, and then the final words of the panel. But uh, thank you, Cardinal. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Minister, for, for sharing your views with, with us, and I'm sure that this debate will continue. Thank you.